Hello, uh, welcome again to our webinar on democracy and its current transformations. Today I have the pleasure to introduce to you um, Wolfgang Merkel. Wolfgang Merkel is professor at the Wissenschaftszentrum in, in Berlin, and he's also currently visiting professor at the Democracy Institute at the Central European University at Budapest. I've known him from a long time ago, you remember in Heidelberg, um, that was maybe 30 years ago, probably. <clears throat> and, uh, and he's going to present us a, quite an interesting subject. The title of his presentation is Migration, COVID, Climate, Who Governs in Deep Crisis? Thank you very much, Wolfgang, for, for um, joining us and um, give you the floor. Gracias, Fernando. <laughs> Buenas tardes uh, a todas y todos. Es un placer estar en Madrid esta tarde, al menos uh, virtual. Pero por la próxima vez me gustaría más estar en vivo en su capital maravilloso. Eso espero. <laughs> Pero uh, es, esta tarde prefiero hablar en inglés porque Bien. no... Quiero torturarles con mi italiano, con un acento uh, teutónico bastante pesado. So, I'm switching. I'm switching uh, to my presentation. And I will talk about new type of crisis. At least I observe new types of crisis at the beginning of the 21st century. And uh, the leading question is, who in those times of crisis is governing? Here are my assumption, my uh, question, and uh, three of my major hypotheses I will present to you this evening. The assumption is, as I have already said, there are new crisis in the 21st century. They have stronger cultural connotation than most of the crises of uh, the previous century. And I'm asking myself and I'm asking you and uh, I'm asking what is the influence of the new crisis on our democracies? Will they withstand or will they change under the pressure of these crises? Uh, I argue there are acute external crises uh, which meet a latent, already ongoing uh, challenge to democracy. And these new crises lead to culturalization, moralization and polarization of our societies. And at the end, I will talk about whether there is a danger of epistemic and illiberal democracy uh, for our still liberal uh, democracies. If you have a look at the academic book market in most of uh, the European countries, and of course, the United States as well, uh, you see the following book titles, Democracy in Crisis, The End of Democracy, Democracy in Decline, How Democracies Die, or as my good friend John Keane has written a very thick book uh, talking about life and death of democracy. So uh, the mainstream of uh, democracy research is quite clear. There is something going on which one can describe as a crisis of democracy. However, uh, you will see that I'm a bit skeptical whether we have indeed the theories in order to decide whether a democracy in crisis and the United States are not Denmark or Finland. And uh, there are differences among the well-established democracies. Uh, if you look here, if you look to this graph, it will show to you 
the development of the quality of democracy starting from 1950 until the present, here to the year 2019. And I have looked at all uh, member states of the European Union, and then I added Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the US, and Japan. And the aggregate mean index shows to you there is a steady increase of the, in the quality of democracy. Here is a very small stagnating period. This uh, was exactly the time when the Soviet empire collapsed and the new democracies came uh, into uh, our uh, site and here you see again a steep increase and it lasted more or less until uh, the year 2007-2008 and since then we see what we have to call from a statistical point of view here uh, as a significant decline in the quality of democracy among the best democracies we have on the globe. Uh, I distinguish between two different types of a crisis of democracy. The first one is a classical one, is an acute crisis, is a question of life or death. It is an existential threat to democracy. And democracies and the actor, the democratic actors have to react. They have to take fundamental decisions. In the um, medical metaphor, they have to look for the right therapy. Otherwise, the patient, otherwise democracy will die. And you know all these examples, uh, which I don't have to go through, uh, from Italy through your country, Spain as well, Greece, Chile, uh, but at present also Turkey and Venezuela. Uh, if Turkey was uh, ever a liberal democracy, I have my doubt, but there was a period uh, after 2000 when the country uh, democratized to a large extent uh, until lasting only five to eight years and the last 10 years were one of the steepest decline of democratic quality we have seen uh, worldwide. This is not uh, the type of crisis we are uh, reading in our texts and in the texts of our discipline, uh, discipline. It is more that we are talking about the second type of crisis of democracy and this is what one can call a latent crisis. Here we are talking about erosion, we are talking about slow decline, decline in quality. And this has to be seen against uh, the background of an unfulfilled normative promises. As we all know, there are quite different sorts of normative uh, promises. If you are a minimalist, a democratic minimalist, so to say, a Schumpeterian, then you think uh, correct uh, general free elections are sufficient for calling a political regime democratic, but you have much more maximalistic uh, concept which reach deeply into economic matters, uh, something uh, we see uh, quite often in uh, Latin America and to some extent, we have seen this in the roaring 20s of the last century, by the way, as well. So to say, a social democratic understanding of uh, democracy. Uh, I briefly will uh, give um, a few words on what I see as an analytical problem. We were not able to define clearly neither theoretically nor empirically, which are the thresholds where we can definitely uh, argue here the uh, crisis starts and then here it ends. 
we are used to talk at least uh, during the last decades from the early 1970s onwards very much about permanently about the crisis of democracy but if we do not define these thresholds and we talk all the time about uh, these kind of uh, democratic crisis, then the whole concept or term becomes paradoxical because then it is a normal state. But as you remember my first slide or one of my first slides were clearly showing now for more than 10 years uh, there is a decline in uh, democratic quality. And these are excellent data taken from uh, varieties of democracy uh, and uh, scholar networks based in Sweden. I'm arguing there are new crises we see at the beginning of the 21st century, and I uh, selected three of them, and you are familiar with it. Um, the first one is a, micro is a migration crisis in 2015. I put it in brackets because this can be considered as an old crisis as well, but there are new ingredients of it. I will briefly talk about it. And then clearly the enduring climate crisis, global warming. This is something uh, which I would certainly call a new type of crisis. And then COVID-19, uh, the pandemic, we are all suffering uh, these uh, days. These three types of crisis can be either latent as up to now for the developed countries, at least the climate crisis, but they can be acute uh, to some extent, as we see now under the auspices of the pandemic. What characterizes these new uh, crises is there is little knowledge among politicians. There is not very much experience of democratic institutions to deal with them. And therefore we, or the political uh, elites need scientific expertise. It's in high demand as you can see each evening when the virologists or epidemiologists are discussing uh, the uh, pandemic crisis. There is a threat that science will be politicized through these uh, crises, but what I also observe, there is a clear moralization of politics, a moralization of different options to solve uh, the crisis. And this will be one of the major points I will talk about because uh, I, I see the risk, the threat, that we are living in, in times where there is a hidden script uh, written by somebody like Carl Schmidt, which transforms political opponents in friend and foes. Uh, Crises are not only an uh, event which we can determine and define by objective data. There are objective facts. Uh, if we look at the migration, there uh, can be and there has been a fast and massive influx of uh, migrants, especially in Germany and Austria and Sweden in 2015. Uh, in global warming, uh, we look at the increase of the uh, average temperature on the globe and in pandemics we used now to count uh, the death. We're looking at mortality rates, but also sometimes to economic losses or the losses of the professional existence. These objective facts are necessary but they are not sufficient. Crises are always constructed. So there is a subjective dimension on them. Crises are crises when people believe that there is a crisis and crises 
need narratives and they need narrators. They need political crisis entrepreneurs who uh, interpret uh, the objective facts as a crisis. If you look, for example, to the migration crisis was especially a right-wing populist. Right-wing populists were defining it as a threat to the rather homogeneous, uh, supposedly homogeneous European uh, society. And they were quite successful if you look uh, to the polls during this time. The social media and the public media as well contributed uh, to the fact that these three crises are interpreted as what they are supposed to be, namely crisis. And what I also observe, there is a growing receptivity among the citizens for these crisis narratives. One could even uh, argue these uh, narratives have become a matter of zeitgeist. So zeitgeist plays an important role as well. What do I mean by scientification of politics? I uh, have argued these crises are rather complex. There is low knowledge among political uh, elites, uh, among those who are deciding about uh, policies, and there is a high demand for a scientific expertise. This applies certainly to the climate crisis and uh, applies uh, still heavily on the pandemic as well. But there is a trend of politicization of science coming within science, uh, but also coming from the outside, from uh, the politicians. And I should not use the singular science. This is already a mistake uh, we hear in the discourses. We should take, uh, we should talk about sciences, plural. Uh, and there are pluralist uh, trends uh, going on and they have to go on because science is uh, looking for truth but never reaches in the most cases. Uh, you may have seen, heard, read about uh, so-called marches for science during the last 10 years, very often uh, organized by scientists themselves. So there is a scientific of, uh, occasion of politics. We used to call it evidence-based policymaking. Uh, in a negative connotation, you could talk about technocratization of politics. And the battle cry of these uh, Fridays for Future or other uh, um, climate activists is science has told us. Science has told us and the politicians have nothing else to do just to transform this uh, truth of sciences into uh, politics and policies. And what uh, you then, if science is an actor within the political realm, we observers, we uh, the audience are now thinking very much in terms of reason versus unreason, truth versus fake. Uh, and this became a part and parcel of our conversations and language. And we sometimes think or science uh, pretends and uh, the reasonable people hope that science is able to define something like the common good. There is a desire uh, to a modern philosopher king and the new philosopher king uh, should be science. Moralization. There is a, a surplus of morale and the surplus transforms morale in moralizing. And moralizing also means that particular uh, morals are pretending to be the general morale. And those who are not following this path, they are out. 
they get excluded. Uh, they are no longer opponents. They are the unrational people and unmoral people. And if you look to migration, then you have those who were skeptical and in favor of closing borders. They were certainly despisers of humanity. The climate crisis, uh, we used to call them deniers because they deny what is obvious. Uh, there is some global warming uh, uh, ongoing. And uh, the protests you have seen in some countries, uh, in Germany in particular, these are the deniers that Corona is a real danger. Just to understand me right, I think this is completely nonsense, this denying uh, climate crisis, denying uh, uh, the danger and risk of uh, COVID-19. And I'm in favor to be an open society, to open uh, borders as, as wide as we can do and as the people can accept. But at the moment where we rational, uh, reasonable be people call the others deniers, then they are out. It's not no longer a matter of opposition. It becomes a uh, binary distinction of the society. There are those who represent the truth and uh, the opposite are the liars. Uh, moralization again, moralization of scientific knowledge means the, the pluralistic irritation we need in science as well becomes a kind of imposition. Recognition. We are no longer really living in an age where we are talking very much about socioeconomic uh, differences, at least not in the public courses, uh, discourses. And this is strange because we see in the developed uh, countries during the last 10 years, an increasing socioeconomic inequality. But this is not really the discourse uh, which uh, defines the situation during the last year. So it gets, uh, the question is no longer who gets what, when, and why. There is an emergence of the recognition debate and uh, identity politics. I would argue um, even this is controversial identity politics from the right, but also from the liberal left. And we are talking in those matters about gender equality, sexual orientation, race, uh, ethnicity, and so forth. And with these identity claims, uh, our language becomes moralistic. It becomes controlled. Uh, if you use the wrong terms, uh, then you are out of the, the discourse as well. And uh, this matter of debating problems uh, uh, became to some extent hegemonic in our society. And this tends to become a zero sum game. If we are talking about distributional question, it's not that difficult to find compromises in our tax system, social policy, and so forth. Uh, how asymmetrical these compromises are, but uh, they are compromises. Otherwise, we would not have a welfare state in capitalist societies. But moral issues tend to become zero sum games. And what I also observe, there's a deepening uh, on the front lines between different ideological camps, uh, as I have described them. Polarization. I would uh, immediately add the adjective pernicious uh, polarization because some polarization is necessary in unequal societies. Uh, but what we are observing also is uh, that pluralization, intensive pluralization, which is good for uh, democracies, 
transforms increasingly in this kind of pernicious polarization. And you have these discursive entrepreneurs I was talking about, uh, especially right-wing populists on the one side and those uh, who most of us probably uh, uh, see uh, us among them, meaning uh, left liberal cosmopolitans. And uh, again, I have to repeat it, I, uh, I locate and place myself among them, but sometimes it's hard to uh, stand the kind of intellectual and discursive arrogance of this camp as well. What we are, uh, what these entrepreneurs, political entrepreneurs are doing, they reframe uh, these conflicts. And this leads what I have talked about, transformation of pluralism into polarization, uh, into the Carl Schmittian uh, essence of political, the friend-foe relation, uh, which pose rationals against irrationals. And democracy is about inclusion. It uh, should include as many as possible into the political community. But what we are going through is more exclusion, exclusion of those which uh, we sometimes consider as amoral. This is what I call a hidden script behind our backs, uh, as it would have been written by Carl Schmidt, and it destroys to some extent the ability to compromise. And to compromise is one of the necessary ingredients of each uh, working democracy. So the crisis sequence is clear. There's a complexity of crisis, and the complexity of crisis refor uh, requires uh, evidence-based scientific knowledge. It has to be channeled into politics. Uh, but in the moment where we talk about science has the truth, uh, then uh, we start to uh, politicize the uh, free research of the subsystem or the a partial uh, regime of science. Moralization of politics and moralization very often leads to exclusion and to polarization. I have uh, five or six more slides, uh, and I have three slides uh, as a kind of excursus uh, on the case of COVID. Who was gover governing uh, among this crisis? And I was looking to some countries, especially in Europe, not so much in the United States, where you have seen uh, grotesque failures at the beginning of, uh, beginning of the crisis. Normally, we argue from a democratic point of view, a few, it is clear the first order sovereign are the people. The people are the uh, sovereign. And since the people as such cannot uh, simply govern, uh, they have a choice. They elect those who represent themselves. And this is especially the parliament. It is the second order sovereign. And the parliament uh, elects, at least in parliamentary system, the executive. And this is what I would call a third order sovereign. And what we now have seen during the crisis, there was a new and fourth order sovereign. These were science, the scientists, the virologists, the epidemiologists. They became a kind of sovereign on their own. What we also have uh, observed is uh, that we were living in a uh, we were living through hours of the executive. I should go back uh, for a second to my slide previous slide. Just the red uh, letters they uh, indicate who indeed governed during this time. It was not the people, it was not the parliament, it was the executive supported by selected, 
selected, carefully selected virologists and it, uh, epidemiologists. So this contradicts to some extent our classical traditional understanding how democracy works and legitimates itself. So uh, you know this, uh, our, the executive, Carl Schmidt again, uh, sovereign is who decides on the state of exception. There was uh, from a uh, classical constitutional point of view, not the uh, classical state of exception, but uh, the executive governed like this uh, and uh, parliament was pushed aside, sidelined. Uh, and what uh, could be observed in quite a few democratic, uh, quite a few European countries, not only the sidelining of the parliament, uh, the parliamentary debate only took place after the executive has decided normally one day before. Then it got to the, made to the media and then uh, the parliament uh, held a debate of already decided uh, matters. And there was also, an, let's say, a silence of the democratic opposition. In Germany, especially the Greens, they became part of the governing coalition. They forgot what uh, opposition has to do, namely to control, to uh, make a uh, to deliver alternative policy proposals, but they were arguing this is not the hour of the opposition, this is the hour of responsibility. Uh, but I do think uh, the responsibility of oppositions have to be uh, that they do, do not forget they uh, have oppositional function in the democracy. There was another point which plagues our democracies anyway, speed. The velocity of changing environments and the requirement that politics should accommodate to this new empire of speed. I would argue sometimes you have to do fast, fast. Uh, do you have to decide fast? Uh, but it is a complete illusion that democratic politics can be as fast as environments uh, change. And uh, uh, if you look, for example, to the financial markets, it is ridiculous to uh, then uh, demand for politics to decide as fast as markets can uh, decide. And what bothered me and uh, would uh, make me afraid of perspectives that very often, at least at the first half of uh, or the first two thirds of the pandemic, the population, the demos applauded to this kind of policy making uh, style. If uh, you are, uh, so to say, sharpening the argument, uh, you could argue uh, what we have seen and still see is governance by fear. But it's a very specific fear, it's rational fear. It's what uh, the scientists have told us that we have to be cautious and uh, so rational fear, and I try to formulate it here in a neutral way, rational fear became a powerful instrument to collect legitimacy and support from those who are governed through this uh, uh, time. And uh, in uh, situations where you have an uncharted territory of uncertainty, in those crises, politicians tend to decide pro-security against liberty. And uh, the populists are the exceptions. They take the risk. They are not so interested in uh, liberty, but uh, they oppose the established politics. And this is what we have seen at the beginning with Trump's uh, uh, insane uh, policy making during 
the pandemic and to some extent in UK as well. So uh, I come to the end talking about is the mode of governance through the COVID-19 crisis a blueprint for upcoming crises as well. This would mean, remember, the executive governs, parliament is sidelines, science has an extreme prominent role, and there might be also a return from supranationalism uh, to the nation state, what we have seen uh, with border closing throughout the pandemic. Uh, the disempowerment of parliaments I have already named. Uh, there is a uh, danger for democracy that health, the protection of lives, so to say health security uh, dominates other important values of uh, democracy. And if again, if you look to the climate crisis, if you look into the discourses of the climate activists, you quite uh, uh, often hear if the governments, the democratic governments were allowed and able uh, to uh, to govern with a, some kind of emergence government, why should it not govern in a similar way the even more and deeper and more widespread and uh, challenging crisis, global warming? And it has a certain logic. It has a certain logic. Uh, if you argue this way, and this is not what I would uh, deny. Uh, so what one could fear is that from crisis to crisis, uh, these crises will leave kind of semi-authoritarian sediments in the collective uh, memory of those who were in government, those who were governed, and even institutions. Though this collective uh, memory uh, could become a problem for a flu a future uh, democracy. The question is uh, if we are witnesses of a kind of birth, emergence of a moralistic epistemic democracy. And it comes with uh, a change from the input, from participation, democratic control to the output. So output trumps input. Uh, it is important uh, what comes out of the decision, not how these decisions were uh, done. It comes with the uh, dominance of the executive over the legislature and science may Trump sometimes representation. At least there will be clashes in the uh, future. And I talked about the new philosopher king and the, the new race between um, competition, between authoritarian regimes and democratic regimes. Who can better master the crisis? There will certainly not this deeply autocratic and repressive regime of the People's Republic of China, but there could be a desire for a Singaporeization of liberal democracy, a legal state, uh, no corruption uh, so far, uh, and they uh, govern through, they decide and they provide good outputs. And this is uh, what I'm uh, afraid about it. It is certainly too early to say we are in a long enduring phase of de-democratization. And I started my presentation saying we have statistical evidence. There is a decline of democratic quality, but uh, we have to look how these too traumatic and too, and to the migration crisis, if it pops up again, 
may leave as negative legacies on our liberal democracies. Thank you very much for your patience listening to me. Thank you, <clears throat> Professor Merkel. Um, thank you very much. It's been um, a pleasure listening to you. I think it was highly interesting. Um, but I was wondering, you've, you've always been um, rather skeptical regarding you know, this diagnosis of um, the crisis of democracy. You've always tried to, um, tried to oppose you know, this, uh, that as a principle. And I think you were right uh, when you, you were referring to some of the advantages of contemporary democracy when compared to democracy just 20, 30 or 40 years ago in things such as gender equality or um, protection of minorities and these kinds of things. But now I'm, I'm, I'm surprised and a little bit scared because you seem to be, you seem to have returned to uh, um, a new kind of skepticism regarding really the future of liberal democracy as we know it, right? And um, because in the end, if, um, if this uh, crisis management leads to uh, an increase in the leadership of the, of the executive, of the nation state, of uh, scientific discourse, um, everything that comes together with what we can define, you know, broadly as, as a certain state of exception, Considering the fact that we are already in a tremendous state of exception because of the climate crisis, you haven't talked very much about it. So, uh, <clears throat> can we come to the conclusion that there's no way back to a situation, to a situation that was before COVID-19, or um, do you think we we may return to a pre-COVID-19 situation where, you know, we in a certain sense, in a certain sense, uh, let's say um, the way normal democracies used to work, without so much so much uh, uh, protagonism on part of of scientists, without uh, so much protagonism on part of the executive, with a well-functioning parliament, um, do you think that's possible? And there's another there's another question that I would I would like to um, I would like to pose, which is. Um, you know, the Orwellization of, of uh, the state, you know, this new surveillance society that COVID-19 has also helped, to, also helped to develop, right? So um, this new idea that because we need to, <clears throat> because security is the utmost objective, um, it doesn't matter if we um, somehow don't, don't pay so much attention to liberty or to certain liberties, right? So control of the population, control of the state of health of the population, even through apps and technological, I mean, through the, through the net or, what, or with whatever means, has, uh, I think, has become somehow a, the new normal. It is, of course, in countries such as Taiwan or, or South Korea, but do you think it will, it will it will expand to Western Europe, for instance. Do you think here we are going to face also um, the menace of, um, well, the threat of, of uh, um, uh, reduction of liberties, which aren't based really off on, a, on a state of exception, because of course lockdowns are based on a state of exception that has been approved by parliament, right? But after the state of exception, uh, how much of those measures that had been taken during the state of exception are going to last afterwards? Hmm? That would be the, that's my worry, uh, more or less, but it's a personal worry, uh, I should say. But, you know, I think the, the most important thing is the first question that I put you. So, is this going to last because we have indeed entered into a, an ongoing crisis that doesn't seem to have an end, which is precisely the climate crisis. There was a quite famous com uh, comedian uh, mm -hmm. in Bavaria in the 1950s and 60s. He used to say, 
predictions are especially risky because uh, they look into the future. <laughs> so uh, it's not uh, completely easy. But I try to answer your um, questions in the following way. Uh, I had some private uh, debates and discussions with my uh, colleague and friend Klaus Offe. Hmm. Klaus Offe was one of the major theorists in the early 1970s with sure, Jürgen yeah. Habermas, yeah. Uh, James O'Connor talking about the crisis of democracy. And I was in a kind of uh, Freudian uh, killing my uh, academic mentor. Uh, I was always against it. And I was even writing articles against it. And I had controversial <laughs> discussions with Klaus Offe. Now I have again with him, but with changing roles. Mm. He don't see, in, at least not in the COVID and not in the climate uh, uh, discourse, the uh, challenges and the risks I see and I have portrayed here in my uh, presentation. And he believed uh, this is an overstatement of uh, what is going on and there should be no uh, real alternative policies. When you are asking, is there no way back to the status quo ante? Before the COVID-19 crisis, I have given my answer. I don't think so. I think it is a naive understanding how politics and uh, political memories work. Uh, to say, uh, uh, let's say it is over next spring somehow, and we, uh, we do not have uh, to fear new waves. Uh, we know what happened. And if the governments, what we all hope, come good out of this situation, then uh, the output orientation gains new legitimacy and uh, the input legitimacy may lose against it. But here we are in the borderline of an illiberal state, as, as you have pointed out. And I, I'm not so much worrying about in the well-established democracies about surveillance. But in a way, uh, the function of surveillance was taken over uh, by these discourses, which I call moralistic. You are not allowed to deviate. And if you deviate, you are amoral. There's a blaming and shaming going on, uh, which uh, streamlines uh, possible dissenters. And this is uh, a limited liberal discourse, uh, according to my uh, point of view. And I tried uh, to uh, hint at this fact, and you know it especially in our spheres, the academic spheres, you have to be very cautious and keen to discuss certain things. Uh, therefore, probably I have, <laughs> I tried uh, to argue here during my presentation, I am a left liberal cosmopolitan. But as such, uh, I cannot easily discuss and criticize uh, the pandemic and uh, climate activists, or if we talk about the illiberal elements of certain versions of Islam. You, you are called uh, a racist. Uh, mm. And here I am, I am uh, feeling myself in the tradition of the enlightenment. And so I see a narrowing of the discourses which may have a similar function of the uh, surveillance. And the last sentence, the collective memory. We should think more about this idea and uh, of institutions. Uh, and I was completely disappointed how the opposition reacted uh, in Germany against uh, this kind of emergency uh, policy uh, and especially about the Greens. Uh, and they are so super representatives of uh, left liberal cosmopolitanism and 
they left the space to the uh, semi-democratic or semi-loyal right-wing populists. They uh, then claimed to be uh, the representatives. However, I have to say, not as successful as uh, they uh, uh, hoped for. Okay, thank you very much. Um, um, Professor Merkel, now, now we'll start with, with, um, with uh, questions from the public. I think, Javier, maybe you can, you can read some, or from yourself. <laughs> Um, okay, there, there are. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. There are several questions from the uh, public. So before uh, asking mine, I will uh, read uh, one one of them. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Tony Sartz uh, is asking if you can elaborate more on the possible impact of the climate crisis on democracy. Um, he's asking if. It can produce some completely new institutions and, and social political cleavages uh, unseen before this this climate uh, threat. Uh, it's it's an important question, and I'm I don't think that I can uh, sufficiently uh, address the question. Nevertheless, uh, the climate crisis. Uh, has uh, first the following um, the following consequence. We all know it is not sufficient whether Spain or Germany or even Europe uh, is uh, coming to a situation where they reduce the uh, emissions. Uh, the uh, what is the word? Uh, the uh, uh, climate problematic emissions uh, to a uh, level where they become neutral. So following uh, the Paris uh, uh, formulated, uh, Paris formulated goals, we need supranational, we need a supranational regime. And supranational regimes are very difficult uh, to combine because you have so many powerful actors, countries, and they have quite different interests. Uh, Denmark does not have the same interest uh, such as India. And even if Europe becomes completely uh, a greenhouse gas neutral, it will be 16% of the global emissions. So we need much more. And there's even the fear if we, Europe becomes neutral uh, with the greenhouse emissions, then the market prices of fossil, uh, fossil gas and energies uh, and oil energies, then uh, they will be cheap on the market. And uh, countries like India, like Pakistan, uh, like Nigeria, Brazil, and others, or even Eastern Europe, uh, will buy it uh, on a cheaper price. This will be something uh, problematic to solve. So we need supranational regimes. And here comes democracy in as well. We also know supranational regimes cannot be democratized as much as a democratic nation state. It would be ridiculous to assume such a climate uh, regime could be uh, driven by the same democratic rules uh, like Sweden, for example. So uh, we might be forced uh, for this supranational regime, they will completely dominate it by the executives. The parliaments will not have a major say. Uh, and uh, we might have to, uh, to opt then for less democracy and more problem solving. So this can be uh, one of uh, the consequences. And I'm rather, last point here. Uh, what you hear then as response from the climate activists when uh, the democratic governments decide on so-called climate packages, on, on policies which reduce uh, the uh, pernicious emissions. 
then they immediately, and this is their job, I understand this, they criticize it, criticize it as completely insufficient. By doing it, they, they, le they legitimate uh, these kind of decision making, and this will be a clash of different understandings of legitimacy. And don't ask me where I would opt for, because it is a tremendous problem we have to solve, and we did we lost quite uh, some time for solving it. Thank I you. think that uh, your answer is, is, is very interesting because uh, your diagnosis runs parallel to the diagnosis that uh, the scientists are uh, doing about the, the, the current crisis. So Professor um, Bayespina has proposed a scenario in which there is no way back to a pre-COVID-19 situation. And climate scientists are, have been saying a similar thing in relation to, to climate change. There is no way back. Therefore, uh, well, we are not uh, obviously climate scientists, but we are social scientists. So looking ahead to the next difficult century, they are saying uh, and they are warning us uh, or asking us to adopt measures not to stop uh, climate change, but already to mitigate the effects of climate change on, on our societies. Um, in view of the present crisis, would you recommend, uh, would you recommend any measure that we can adopt to mitigate the future damages of, of, of this climate crisis on our democracies. Can you say a word what you mean by mitigate? Reduce the damage of, of, of uh, the, the crisis that we are suffering in, not, not, not um, prevent the damage, uh, but uh, reduce uh, up to a certain point the, the damage that, that our democracies will suffer during this uh, future crisis. So it's not the physical damage, it is the democratic damage. The democratic, yeah, which is our uh, area. How can you do it? You can do it by efficient, effective policies, clean policies. That what I, uh, is what I meant by uh, Singaporean uh, kind of policy making style. Science uh, plays an important role and becomes a source of legitimacy because uh, it helps to find out which are the most appropriate measures to fight climate change. And uh, a parliament will not be able to do it because uh, if they decide on reducing the emissions, they have at the same time to look at different tasks. Policy making uh, is a multitasking uh, uh, a style of governance, meaning they have to look to the labor market, they have to look to economic growth, uh, they have to look what it means for uh, security. So at the same time, they have to look to different aims. Uh, and therefore, they come up with hopelessly sometimes uh, inappropriate measures. Uh, and this is a chance for a kind of soft re-autocratization of our policy making. And what I meant uh, with uh, a look at the uh, events of the pandemic is that the people may applaud. The people may applaud. And the people, nobody says that our population is so firm and keen on democratization and democracy. If you look to Hungary, there is a majority, even without pandemic, a majority for a kind of semi-autocrat uh, at the top of the government. So uh, mitigating uh, by effective policies, by effective problem solving, and maybe, maybe uh, by uh, compensating through uh, kind of welfare measures. Uh, this is a typical uh, instrument for richer autocracies uh, that they have a kind of informal contract you give up your liberty, therefore we uh, secure you uh, in social and economic matters. Uh, Wolfgang, I'll, I'll add one question from, from myself. So we have several questions. Um, there are lots of them 
that have to do with climate crisis, I think we, can, we could skip them. Javier, if you don't mind, because if not, you know, we will monopolize you know, the, whole, the whole discussion through that. But there seems to be a, a certain contradiction between uh, stating on the one hand that science trumps representation, and on the other hand, uh, affirming that you know the the status quo, the main status quo regarding uh, regarding political struggles, is based on polarization, right? So if science trumps, if science rules, it's difficult to see uh, how it can work without. I mean, how how you can you can think of a of a polarized opposition to science, except in the extreme irrational matter, uh, manner that we have seen in the United States, for instance, without taking their masks, uh, you, know, um, you know, this Fauci versus Trump uh, spectacle, you know, that we've been watching these last, uh, these last months before he left office in, in, in the White House. So there seems to be a, a polarization regarding the status of truth, don't you think? So... Um, because there's this coincidence of, an, you know, of, of the, the new relevance of science in the public sphere, but on the other hand of, of conspiracy theories at the same time, right? So um, how, does, how can it work? I mean, how, um, because um, in order to oppose yourself to government, you have to think of an alternative worldview. If not, you disappear as an opposition. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, if you get what I mean, right? Uh, and so if, if science, science is supposed to be, well, conventional science is supposed to be the truth, which goes against, you know, the, the democratic principle where everything is subject to opinion, right? So um, platonic rulers again, right? So if, if we have to base our decisions on, on scientific uh, certainties, then... Uh, what does the opposition do? I mean, they, they cannot bring in another worldview that's opposed to the one, you know, that's held by the executive. So in, in Spain, what we've seen, I think the, the reaction in Spain was, was different than other European countries. In Spain, because, maybe because we are uh, more polarized than any other European country, at least in, in the Western ones, uh, what we have seen is an irrational reaction during the pandemic on part of the opposition, that they went to the streets where we're all, you know, under lockdown, uh, shouting, freedom, we want freedom, right? So, very close to this Trumpian reaction against, against, uh, against that. So, uh, what I don't see how it fits is, to say it again um, shortly, is um, to, to state on the one hand that Science might be ruling now in the public sphere, so science is going to so technocracy or technocratic solutions, right, in order to solve the crisis. And on the other hand, what do we do with uh, polarized political systems? So, how can the opposition argue for their, uh, I mean, for the values and for the uh, what they have to be the correct solution of the of the um, of the main of the main problems? Uh, first, I would argue uh, you did now the same what I did at the beginning, using uh, science as a singular. And if you look back to the COVID-19 crisis, uh, at the beginning, science uh, did not uh, uh, nearly know as much about the virus and the pandemic as they know now. And what could be observed, I'm, I don't know how it was in Spain, but in Germany, then uh, different politicians favored uh, different epidemiologists and virologists. And the, the uh, science did not only produce knowledge about the virus, they went a step further. They recommended steps to fight the virus. So they stepped into politics as well. 
And our chancellor had a clear selection of those scientists, virologists, who were on the most skeptical side, who were uh, proposing the harshest uh, measures. Hmm. Uh, and there are two star virologists in Germany, the one uh, very from coming from the Charité, from the Humboldt University. He became a real star in uh, Germany, Drosten is his name. And on the other side, the, uh, the CDU competitor to uh, Merkel, the next chancellor candidate probably, mm. uh, was, uh, so to say, adopting and uh, uh, bringing him in his team, one of the most liberal uh, virologists who claimed that we should be more selective, not having this uh, hydraulic understanding of lockdown opening, lockdown opening, uh, more selective and more liberal measures. And if you look to the Swedes. Yeah. Again, there, there were different outcomes. Not that I think these were the best outcomes we can think about it, but science took a different stand. And uh, we have to hope, or I will hope, uh, that this pluralism, this competition for truth in science uh, has uh, to be alive. If not, if one science becomes too dominant, then the reaction at least of a part of the people is conspiracy. They, yeah. they yeah. feel yeah. impotent. They yeah. feel impotent against it, then they simply deny it and they protest. Uh, and then they can become uh, the, um, the victim or uh, they can become voters for the right-wing populist parties and the right-wing populists tried it and they would find an easier terrain because uh, the uh, rational, most of the rational democratic politicians uh, would be against uh, just denying science. So, uh, I wouldn't like to say with one single word that we don't need science, but we need the plural, uh, an open pluralist society. And we need a controlled government which should not only select those uh, scientists which confirm the, uh, the positions of the politicians uh, which they had even before the empirical scientific evidence. But we should be also somehow um, somehow sober about uh, our population. Uh, I don't think uh, that uh, all will become rational. Maybe it's even not the best for a society and we will have uh, people who believe in this conspiracy. And we had it before, those who, uh, who uh, reject each form of vaccination for their children. This was already 20% uh, in our societies uh, and they become activated uh, in this situation. Okay, thank you. Um, Javier, do you have more, more questions? Yes, um, well, actually, Professor uh, Angel Valencia just posed uh, a question that is very similar to the one uh, uh, you just answered from Professor Vallespin. I hope uh, that, that Professor Merkes uh, answered uh, both, both, both of them. But in any case, if there is something else that remains unanswered, uh, we remind you that you can reframe the questions again and thus we can continue. The, the conversation. But meanwhile, and, and talking about sciences in, in plural, I would like to ask you about the about this 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 issue. Would you say that um, social sciences uh, have been the great absence in the in the management of the current uh, COVID nineteen crisis? I think that uh, sciences such as social psychology, sociology, anthropology. Uh, well, they, they have a, a great deal to say about the reaction of, of population to, to pandemics and, and, and their solutions. 
Um, because, well, after all, a, a pandemic is, has both a physiological and a social uh, dimension. Um, however, at least in Spain, social scientists have denounced their, their absence in, in, in government plans. Um, well, I would like you uh, to comment if this has been the same situation in Germany. Um, it's quite interesting what you are saying, Javier. Uh, I would not talk about uh, social scientists because sociologists uh, were present uh, looking, what does it mean for certain echelons, classes of the society, what for the children, what for the educational system, they were present. Who was absent? And this I criticized publicly in Germany and I didn't make friends. Uh, political scientists. Political scientists on the democracy question were quite silent and uh, I was considered as somebody who is an, an uh, so to say, an outlier uh, of uh, the community. And now the interesting point comes, who was very much present were lawyers, constitutionalists, yeah. they were criticizing uh, the missing democratic elements. Uh, and uh, it is a complete uh, uh, conversion of the roles both faculties and sciences played in the 1970s or in the early uh, after years after 2000. So we were constitutionalists. And this reflected to some extent the constellation of uh, the uh, constitutional powers as well. Parliament, as I have said, were marginalized and agreed to some extent to this kind of marginalization, but not the courts. The courts stopped quite often. The executives, especially in the lender, in the single states, in the uh, Comunidades Autonomas of uh, uh, Germany, and there are uh, 100 or at least some months ago, already 150 decisions where courts stopped the executive, mostly arguing this is not proportional what you are doing. So they were the critical instance, but not uh, these very reasonable political scientists. It's interesting that uh, there's a kind of similar uh, uh, experience in Spain as well. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So uh, the main protagonists were indeed uh, uh, constitutionalists. Yeah. So because, you know, this was a new situation, state of uh, of alarm, as we call it, right? So state of exception. So that's, uh, and we didn't really know because, you know, the the constitution was not that clear. We didn't need, did, uh, we didn't really know how it had to be applied, which uh, which uh, liberties had to be, uh, or how they have to be restricted, and so on and so forth. So it, it was more a legalistic, a legalistic issue than a political scientific issue. Uh, Javier, um, have one more questions? So let's take two more. Uh, Wolfgang, we don't want to have you for too long. There, there is a question from Carmen Ormigo. Um, she's asking uh, the following. This conjunction of crisis, isn't it on purpose? If the objective facts are not enough, if on the one hand there is an excess of bad information and on the other hand, the citizen does not have uh, credible uh, um, references, is it not a way of anesthetizing, uh, of an anesthesia of the population, increasingly disappointing in how does liberal democracy respond to current problems? Very interesting, very interesting um, um, anesthesia. Uh, maybe uh, in my presentation, I, uh, I emphasize too much uh, the passive role of parts of the population, except, uh, except those uh, deniers, corona deniers. What, you, what we now observe, and here I, I'm just a political observer of what is going on in Germany during the last weeks, there is a certain fatigue. 
the people are tired. Hmm. The people want their lives back. And this is the reason. And here comes representative democratic politics in against, to some extent, scientific knowledge. Uh, is a complete different situation compared uh, to the summer and early fall last year. Uh, the scientists, the virologists are warning, uh, but the people uh, signal, we are sick of this lockdown. We want to fly to Mallorca. We want to open restaurants. We want to go to a barber shop and go shopping. Uh, and the virologists in their majority are arguing, no, we should keep on our harsh lockdown for the next three weeks, and then we may be uh, in the line with a zero COVID. This is an initiative by scientists, zero uh, COVID. But the population now is not willing it to do it. Uh, and... Uh, the government lost some of the legitimacy and, so to say, the command on uh, the behavior of the citizen uh, because it failed. It failed in whole Europe, especially the European Union. It will be a crisis of the European af Union afterwards. I'm pretty sure different aspects. Uh, because they were not able uh, to acquire vaccines uh, to an amount we observe in other countries, Israel, even the United States, United Kingdom. And this delegitimated the government with the effect that the people do not want to follow uh, them uh, without uh, objections. And this is, so to say, a tipping point I am observing here. Uh, it's, it's a paradox to some extent. Representative politics are coming back hmm. and it may not uh, contribute to the public good of public health. Hmm. Uh, but these are dilemmatic situations and not easy uh, to solve. And I even don't want to say now good that we have representative politics because they should trump science. This is a dilemmatic situation we all have in ourselves sometimes. Yeah, and it has. I think it has it has a lot to do with fear. So people are not fearful yeah. anymore. I mean, so yeah. so how long can you be fearful? Right. And 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 fear is. I mean, this is the Hobbesian equa equation. So so without fear, you don't need. <clears throat> you don't feel the need for more state, right? Or for or for a drastic decisions. And I think this this is changing um, if compared to to the beginning of the to the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, Javier, uh, do you think we, uh, any, any more questions? Okay, then we can leave it here. Um, Wolfgang, it's been really a pleasure. I think you, you have presented uh, quite an intelligent and thoughtful, um, um, thoughtful lecture. And we'll, uh, we'll keep thinking of it, you know, for, for enough time, you know, in order to, to post to ourselves far more, a lot of questions that we didn't have the time to to think of while you were while you were presenting it. Thanks a lot, and well, we'll keep in touch anyway. Okay, thanks goodbye. To you Thank you, and thanks to everybody. Thanks to everybody, and we'll we'll see us again on on Monday. Thank you.